they don't realize the value of developing those relationships you know that that um that you there's you know it, it's it's not a one plus one equals two equation it's a one plus one equals three this is a security weekly production security weekly is a resource of cyber risk alliance The Cybersecurity Collaborative, in conjunction with Cyber Reason, is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC. Hi, I'm your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Mark Weatherford, Chief Information Security Officer at Alert Enterprise and Chief Strategy Officer at the National Cybersecurity Center. Well, thanks, Todd, and thanks for having me. I'm happy to chat with you today. So, it's kind of an interesting. I mean, it, uh, probably like a lot of people, you know, I certainly didn't plan to be a uh, get in the in the information security field at, at, until, you know, one day at some point in my life, I said, hey, you know what? This actually could be kind of cool. But, uh, you know, so I started in the Navy, uh, and I was in the Navy, and I was doing. Um, signals, signals, intelligence, kind of things, and there was always a uh, kind of a security component to 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 that, and um, ended up I ended up going to grad school in it's still in the Navy, going to grad school in the early '90s, and I wrote my my thesis, graduate thesis on information assurance. And uh, as I tell people, you know, when when you're writing a thesis and you're looking for research and you're looking for resources, there were not a lot of resources in 1994 on information security. So uh, I won't say I made a lot of stuff up, but I, um, uh, I was very creative in finding a lot of the research that ended up going into my thesis. And as a result of that, um, it kind of changed the trajectory of my my career. I, I graduated and I was still in the Navy. I went to a Navy command and I became the information security officer. And then uh, I went to my next command. I became the chief information officer. And then I went to my, to my final command and I was running uh, network defense operations for the Navy. So, um, you know, it, I would say, I always say, you know, that my career started in the Navy. Uh, and after I got out of the Navy, I, you know, was continued to work in security. And by serendipity, um, I, I moved to Colorado and uh, this governor for the state of Colorado was hiring a chief information security officer and I ended up getting selected for that job and you know the rest is history I've been and, and there were no lot of uh, no, state no. CISOs at that time I either, think there were right? there were it was the number was certainly less than 20 probably mm -hmm. 10 to 15 we and we had we'd had a, a uh, MSI sat conference of all things in Denver like a month after I joined so all of the existing CISOs from the other states showed up and I think the, it was probably 15 people or so that were there and uh, but yeah it was really early on and then um, then from there I went and I uh, uh, went and worked in the Schwarzenegger administration as the CISO as his first CISO in the state of California uh, then I went and I was the chief security officer for the North American Electric Reliability Corporation where I worked with electric utilities all around the, the North America and that's when I was tapped to um, ask by the Obama administration to come in and uh, and run security for the federal government so and then I've had a couple of security jobs since then I went it came out to Silicon Valley and I worked in a startup for about almost four years and booking holdings you know we're uh, the largest online travel agency in the world all the time <laughs> yeah everybody does you know you, it's, it's open table here, yeah. you know booking kayak uh, Priceline, you know, they're all well-known brands, and uh, that's so why I, I know, that's why I use them, by the way, because I know you're there keeping <laughs> all my stuff secure. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's interesting because then I tell people I work there, and they're like, "Oh, I just used Open Table yesterday," and so yeah, it is a good company, you know, and we're all, we have products that everybody uses on a daily basis. Good. So you've seen uh, government, uh, you've seen, um, you know, the startup world, 
Uh, you've, you've been in the military. So what, what do you think some of those differences between those organizations are? You know, I, I get asked this a lot. Um, and I, I would say the primary difference is one is revenue dependent and the other one is not. And by that I mean, you know, when you're in private industry, you know, you have shareholders or you have a board um, and people expect, you know, a certain amount of revenue out of your company. Um, whereas in the government, it's not, you know, not driven so much by that as by policy and by um, expectation of, 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 of taxpayers. Um, and, you know, I can say too, though, in, in both, I think what is so similar is we've seen an evolution uh, in both public and private sector where um, where chief security officers and chief information security officers are more and more getting invited to participate in the, the business of the business, if you will. Um, again, it's very organization and person dependent, but um, it, 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 there's there's a lot more opportunity for us today to be part of the executive team, and I'm part of the um, the leadership team there. Sure. I get involved in business decisions. I'm I'm able to, you know, to make recommendations and inject into you know business level conversations sometimes where it's appropriate. And I think you know that's probably that's the similarity, but the, the difference is really. Um, when, when you're a revenue generating organization or revenue dependent organization, um, you know, the, there's it's a it, lot different kind of pressure on um, on the company for all kinds of things. You know, uh, costs are managed a lot more closely. And you have to justify your costs a lot better than you do in the government sometimes. Mm -hmm. So did you find your approach was different then for, you know, looking at those different environments? Yeah, I, it is because I think in the private sector, you really do have to build a business case a lot of times. I mean, um, I can, uh, you know, I, I know that I may need a product or, I, you know, as I'm building my budget, I have to keep in mind the um, thinking about the enterprise, the, the company as a whole, and how my budget can fit in. And oftentimes you, ha you, know, you have to make decisions on, okay, how do I compromise on that budget be for the good of the business? Um, maybe not compromise too much. I mean, obviously, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to draw a line with, with, um, with where you want the security program to be. But, you know, again, to be a leader in a business, you have to understand and work with the business. Sure. Absolutely. And and you wrote a, a great piece in the in the CISO Compass book around um, relationship matters. Uh, you you want to walk us through your your scenario? Yeah. Yeah. So so when I was in the state of California, um, you know, I knew I literally knew nothing about how government worked. I mean, I come from Colorado, which was a small state. I think I had I think we had like 24 state departments in Colorado. In California, I had like, I think there's about 165 departments, scale. you know, yeah, departments, councils, commissions, boards, and yeah, a, a completely different scale. And um, as I, as, as someone told me, and I'll, I'll be nice about how I say it, but there's, there's a typically three types of organizations in state government. There's there's organizations that receive funds from the federal government, you know, like uh, like US, uh, like the, the Department of Agriculture or um, Department of Transportation, you know, the, the, a lot of funds come through the feds for that. Then you have the, um, the self-funded organizations within the state, like tax department or Department of Motor Vehicles, you know, they're generating their own funds to operate on. And then you have what is commonly called the bottom feeders. You have the state agencies, the more majority of state agencies that are dependent upon the legislature to fund them. And there's never enough money in a state's budget to fund a lot of stuff. So um, so what I what I did and, and I real once I really understood this funding model and I realized that you know the only way to really advance a security program in state government would be to figure out a way to get some of these, you know, these state-funded agencies and departments to collaborate more closely with some of the agencies that, perhaps, you know, that had a little bit more money and were able to 
um, to direct their, their annual budgeting a little bit better. Um, so I, uh, you know, I, I created this, uh, an organization of state CISOs, um, and I, I, I was really a facilitator, you know, I don't want to give myself too much credit for it. I was a facilitator of bringing these, these CISOs and, and security directors together on a fairly regular basis. And um, the value of that was developing relationships. You know, people that would have never known each other and certainly never talked to each other. Um, you know, we created an avenue and a forum for them to get together. And, uh, and for me, the, it was, it was, I was able to catalyze um, value from the larger agencies to the smaller agencies. Um, so by sharing your practices, sharing, sharing things, yes, and, and 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 actually sharing physical stuff. So this was before the cloud, um, you know, in, in the early in the mid two thousands. But so we're still buying a lot of hardware in those days, and uh, um, you know, when when one of the bigger agencies and and, and I would talk to them, and I kind of knew when they were going to buy, you know, make a big purchase on some technology, and I say, hey, you know, this small agency over here could use one of those, um, and this agency could use one of those. And we're, you know, we're able to be very creative about our, our uh, procurements that way. And um, even if they, we didn't, weren't able to buy new stuff, we were able to say, let's take some of your old things that you're going to replace and repurpose it for some of the smaller agencies. And um, yeah, uh, again, I don't think it's all that unique to, to have been created like that. But we were really able to raise the bar in security in the state as a result of developing those relationships. Um, and I will, uh, you know, to, to, to um, take this to a different, different part of the conversation. I have six major brand companies. I have Priceline, Agoda, um, uh, OpenTable, Kayak, Booking, and Booking Transport, which used to be called um, rental cars. And these are independent companies, they're scattered across the globe, and, um, but we're an enterprise organization and I'm building an enterprise security organization by helping these companies, the, the security, the CISOs and the, and the security teams at each of these companies work together, share information together, um, communicate better together. We do a lot of enterprise level buying of, of, of products and services now. Um, so instead of you know one brand going out and negotiating with a vendor on a product, we typically now say, okay, if if you if one company wants something, is is this something that's that's you know uh, unique to them, or should it be applied more broadly across the entire enterprise? Usually, you can say it should be more broadly applied. And what we do then is you know we will find uh, one or two of the companies to to run a POC. Um, then we do kind of a technical analysis of, of the, the results of that and we decide if it's good then we go and negotiate um, enterprise-wide. So do and, you set standards across those companies then or is it pricing if they want to sign up? So I was so, so we have not developed standards yet but but we're going that we will get to there at some point. I mean, right now we're, we're kind of we're kind of twelve months into this uh, into this idea of of sharing and collaborating more because again these are all you know these companies they have their own uh, uh, revenue streams and uh, and but but we're already seeing incredible efficiencies uh, we're seeing incredible cost savings but more than anything I think we have developed really unique relationships between the brands now and you know in, in the in the cyber world you know the ability to share threat and vulnerability information in a real-time basis is really really important it helps us and we found you know really early on or i did i guess uh, that you know if if one brand, if one travel agency brand is experiencing a problem with a certain kind of actor or a certain kind of a threat, it's a good bet that the other brands are experiencing right. the same thing. Right. So, so if one person sees it, you know that we, you know, we put kind of the red alert out to everybody, and we're able to get in front of a lot of these things really quickly. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass 
Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, available at Amazon.com and other booksellers. Did you, did you find that in the state government with the county governments that, that, you know, there was a lot of sharing? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So, um, so again, I've been out of state government now for a decade, but, um, but at the time, yeah, we, the, you know, when I talked about the bottom feeder uh, mm-hmm. uh, agencies, the counties and cities were, were right down there. I mean, you know, their budgets are very, very limited. So we were able to, I think with the most success we had working with the local governments was on security training. So we'd go out and buy a, a bulk, you know, uh, buy training in bulk from, you know, from a vendor. And then we'd, we'd just kind of throw it out and let the, the uh, local governments come and participate in, 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 you know, and they would never be able to afford to send somebody off for a week to, you know, to a training that costs, you know, five or six thousand dollars. But when we could bring it in and, and say, you know, they would come in and we would find a facility and say, OK, anybody can come. You know, we can, can handle up to 300 people in this mm-hmm. facility. You know, there's the economies of scale of doing that are just profound. Sure. So, yeah, we were I, we were really a really successful with them. And I would get. Um, occasionally, I would get you know one of the one of the local governments would they may not have a CISO, but their IT you know person would come and, and ask me, hey, you know, would you mind reviewing my policies that I'm looking at at pushing out here? So I was able to um, you know to provide that kind of capability, and you know at, at, at relatively low um, resource cost to me, but the value to them was profound. Sure. What other things did you did you share? So you mentioned policies and technologies and hardware and um, were there other things that and threat intelligence? Um, you know, you so share? threat intelligence again. This was this was a long time ago, and right then, before I yeah. mean, now we're sharing yeah. a lot of threat yeah. intelligence. And you know, so the, so the answer is yes, but it was a lot of kind of you know sneaker net uh, uh, intel sharing. We didn't have a lot of the. Um, the real-time capabilities that we have today, you know, this was way before before that. But, but yeah, we did. I mean, I had I, I developed, you know, my own kind of little mail list of of all of the uh, the people in state in state and local government um, that you know I would even share, you know, okay, here's my here's my my monthly user awareness kind of uh, 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 blog post. And I could share that with the local governments as well. And you know, relatively low lift for me to do that um, with organizations that simply, you know, either didn't have the technical expertise or the capacity to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. So, So what sort of recommendations would you give for, you know, those local governments or, uh, you know, subunits of larger enterprises. Yeah. If you're in that, if you're in that environment, to how would you interact with other organizations that are sharing information? Well, and, you know, the good news is, you know, the world has changed a lot in the last decade. There, are, there are a lot more resources available at no or low cost uh, today than there were then. <clears throat> um, you know, it, there's so much online information so much um, technical data online that you know just doesn't you can just mm-hmm. you can subscribe to things it, it's almost overwhelming it, it is almost there's, overwhelming. there's, there's so much uh, yeah you know, i know nist pumps out a lot oh. of stuff and it's and if you're a small organization and, and just, you know we say go to nist uh, it's uh, the eyes can kind of glaze over. I yeah. mean, it glazes yeah. over for larger organizations. For me, I mean, you know, I, I you know, I used to subscribe to, I think like you know, fifteen or twenty blogs a day, and uh, it, it really became overwhelming. But the other thing is, I, I you know, you, after a while, you see a trend where you say, okay, I'm seeing the same thing here, 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 here. You know, and you just kind of winnow that down to a more manageable number. But I think. You know, back to your point, though. You know, um, these these smaller organizations, these resource challenge organizations, really need to find champions, um, and they're always champions. They're always people willing to help. Um, so, you know, in in government, you know, looking to 
um, the state or looking to, um, you know, DHS offers incredible resources to uh, state and local government and even the private sector these days. Um, they have a program called the Cybersecurity, oh, I guess it's called CSA Cybersecurity, um, not assessment. I forget what it's called, but anyway, um, they have a program called CSA where they they actually have people um, in uh, I think 15 or 20 regions around the country um, that are available. And you call them up and you say, "Hey, can you come and give me a, an assessment of my of my environment?" And these guys can come in and do that. And as you mentioned too, NIST is you know NIST is a fount of resources. Yeah. Um, and, and not to diminish this, I mean, I, because I love what they do, um, but you have to take it with the operational grain of salt too. And, you know, NIST is a, um, they're, they're a, uh, you know, a think tankish kind of an organization. And you always have to, you know, put your operational lens on the things. It's kind of like do. the ideal, if, if you had all the money and re your resources in the world, because oh my gosh, you, you would, would be, you, yeah, you would be, you would be perfect. <laughs> it would be beautiful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, again, I I love NIST, and I think they have. I, I used to uh, when I was a when I was a consultant several several years ago, I would go to. I had customers in different places around the world and everybody was using the NIST framework. Yeah. You know, it was just so, and, and, and they, you know, cause it's one, it was free, but it was pretty darn good too. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, it's that relationships thing, having those relationships and knowing where to find resources, knowing where to ask for resources is, you know, that you just, you can't get any better than that. Right. I mean, otherwise you're that individual that's trying to do it all by yourself. Yeah. And, and you know, I think and that's a good point is I think there's still people that grow up in our security community that feel like they have to do that. Like maybe not have to, but they don't realize the value of developing those relationships, you know, that, that, um, that you, there's, you know, it, it's, it's not a one plus one equals two equation it's a one plus one equals three or one plus one plus one equals three equation when you start um, getting additional resources to come and help you okay. absolutely well mark it, it's been a pleasure today to talk to you and I, I really appreciate your contribution to CISO compass and all the things that you've done thanks and Todd. Cyber Reason is the champion for today's defenders, providing an endpoint security platform to prevent, detect, and respond to malicious operations on computers, mobile devices, servers, and the cloud. Cyber Reason, end cyber attacks from endpoints to the enterprise to everywhere. Learn more at cyberreason.com slash CISO stories.